These words are true. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the rock on which we stand. And you're not going anywhere. You are strong, secure, and sure. Our ground of hope, our confidence, and all other ground is sinking sand. There is no other savior. There is no other hope. There is no other way to be found in good standing when we step out of time and into eternity and meet you, our maker, our sustainer. Lord, we pray even this morning as we open your word that you, by your Holy Spirit, would help us to have soft hearts, eager ears, ready to listen and heed what you have said. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you have chosen to disclose yourself, your ways, your mind, your heart, your expectations to us, that we might hear them, cling to them, and live. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to continue our study this morning in the book of Romans. You can find your way to Romans chapter 9, and we'll be looking at verses 30 to 33. In 2010, a physician issued a report that stated that healthcare workers are twice as likely as those in other fields to experience an injury from a violent act at work. Why is that? Because patients often respond to their caregivers as if their caregivers are a threat to their well-being. Similarly, first responders are often attacked by those they are trying to help. In 2014, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimated that 2,600 EMS workers received hospital treatment due to injuries resulting from work-related violence. And you know the phenomenon of a drowning victim who will clutch at anything to try to keep his head above water, even submerging his would-be rescuer. There's a syndrome for this. It's been labeled AVIR syndrome, aquatic victim instead of rescuer syndrome. And many times the drowning victim or the would-be drowning victim survives and the rescuer perishes. What do all these phenomena have in common? The one in need despises the one giving help. The rejection of the one thing they most desperately need, they have despised their rescuer. One in a dire situation is not truly aware of their condition or of their need, and they did not recognize the remedy when it came. The rescuer seemed like a threat. I think that is what we find in a large scale with the Jews in the first century, in Paul's day when he wrote the letter of Romans. Let's read together Romans 9, 30 to 33. Paul says, what shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. Just as it is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. What we're going to see this morning played out for us in the relationships between Jew and Gentile in the first century church are three surprising truths about getting to heaven. And the truths here are for us, for any human being. For all humans everywhere, these three truths, while on display in a first century church, which is becoming increasingly populated by Gentiles, while the gospel is increasingly rejected by the Jews to whom it came, these principles apply to every human being who has ever lived. And in Romans chapter 9, beginning in verse 30, there's something of a turn. The first 29 verses of Romans chapter 9 have dealt predominantly with God's sovereignty in his plan of salvation for sinners. We've been dealing with the doctrines of election and predestination and God's sovereign, free, electing grace by which he chooses some to be saved. And when we come to chapter 9, verse 30, 
really all the way through the end of chapter 11, we turn the corner to deal with another side of the same coin. That is the side of human responsibility. Humans are responsible to believe. That will be Paul's argument, beginning in this verse all the way to the end of chapter 11, culminating in that great doxology where God gets all of the glory. And the reason God gets all of the glory, even when humans exercise faith in the gospel, is because that faith comes as a gift from God, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. And we see that also here in Romans 9 to 11. That human responsibility and God's sovereignty in salvation are not at odds with each other. They, in fact, are compatible with one another. They complement one another. It is the responsibility of man to believe the gospel in order to have a right standing with God by faith. And this faith does not negate the whole context that we've looked at in Romans 9 of God's sovereign mercy. Clearly, God's sovereign kindness is behind human faith. Any human faith that is a genuine trust in the saving gospel is a faith that comes from God. This is why the doxology at the end of Romans 11, at the conclusion of this section of human responsibility, ends with, for from him and through him and to him are all things, to him be the glory forever, amen. This whole section of Romans 9 to 11 is a defense of God's integrity. You'll remember that God has made great promises to believers in the gospel from Romans 1 all the way to Romans 8, culminating in in that fantastic uh, litany of promises in Romans 8. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ, and there is no separation from the love of God for those who are in Christ. But these promises are only as good as God is good to keep his word. And so Romans 9 to 11 begins a defense of God's own integrity. In Romans 9, 6, Paul asks the question, it is not as though the word of God has failed, which implies the assumption that if we had lived in the first century and we had read Romans 8 perhaps for the first time in letter form from the Apostle Paul while sitting in the Roman church, which was filling up with Gentiles while Jews to whom promises were made were neglecting their own Messiah, we should have a problem (laughs) Because God has made promises to Israel that seem to be falling apart. And if God's promises to Israel are falling apart, then can I really trust God's promises to little old me from Romans 8? And so Romans 8 and 7 and 6 and 5, all the way back through this epistle to the Romans, all the promises bound up for us in Christ's finished work on the cross depend on God's own integrity to keep all of his promises That is the problem that Paul is dealing with in Romans 9 to 11. And he says the word of God cannot fail. And the word of God cannot fail in Romans 9 precisely because God is sovereign and he actually saves those that he chooses to bestow his undeserved mercy upon. Romans 9 does not say the word of God cannot fail because some humans will choose to believe. No, that belief is grounded on the bedrock promises of God to actually save some. And the human responsibility of belief in the gospel is the means produced by God through which men cling to the truths that God establishes. So in the end, we must say God is the one who saves. And he saves sinners through the means of the response of faith. That is the corner we're turning here from verse 30 and following through the end of chapter 11. Man's responsibility to believe the gospel becomes the focus here. And again, that culminates in all glory going to God. (laughs) Because from election to regeneration to faith to adoption to justification, all of it is from him, through him, and to him. What we see in Romans 9, 30 to 33 are some surprising truths about getting to heaven. Some surprising truths about getting to heaven. We'll look at three of them. The first is this, an unexpected outcome. An unexpected outcome. That is, eternal life is given to people who do not attempt to earn it. Eternal life is given to people who do not attempt to earn it. And there is an ironic twist here. Paul lays out the efforts, the running, the racing of an entire nation of people who had God's regulations, who had God's directions, who had God's own self-disclosure 
in his word and yet who missed the mark. You see, there is one group looking for something, expecting something, laboring for something, and does not get it. And another group, not looking, not laboring, gets it. Paul says, Romans 9, 30 and 31, what shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. This is an unexpected outcome. And the vocabulary here, the, the word to pursue in verse 30 and the word to pursue in verse 31, the words attain in verse 30 and arrive in verse 31, these are all words that when used together often depict the racetrack. That is a, a foot race of, of people competing against one another to cross the finish line before the other. Often when these words are used together, they, they depict what is happening when people are pursuing rapidly toward an objective against one another. To pursue is to, to run or to race after something. And to attain is to win, to, to make the prize your own. And to arrive is often to come first, to attain the goal. And, and when these words are used together, they conjure up this imagery of a race what is it that the Jews were racing after and that Gentiles were not? Paul tells us they were pursuing righteousness. And, and Paul has in mind here forensic righteousness. That is the, the righteousness that is a legal declaration, a, a pronouncement of righteousness. That is a, a vindication on judgment day, the, the declaration from heaven that that one is righteous. And while some assume that they can receive that heavenly vindication, the, that declaration of righteousness, some believe that they can achieve that by trying to do things righteously or trying to do righteous things. The gospel makes it clear that the only way that is truly attained is by faith. And Paul hints at that in verse 30 when he says that Gentiles attain righteousness. Which righteousness? And then you get this little phrase, even the righteousness which is by faith. And he's hinting about where he's going. But the contrast here is with the Jews who are pursuing a righteousness, pursuing a vindication before heaven, a declaration from God that they are righteous. And they are running after it. And they're running after it in a certain way. Now, some of you in this room are runners, and you will not like this illustration. I'm not a runner, and I like this illustration. I've run, I believe, two 5K runs with my wife. I, I remember them both. I, I'm confident it's only two. And each of them was five whole Ks. I felt every one of those. And it was, a, it was a 5K race where all 5Ks were run at one time. Not like you get to do a little bit on Tuesday and a little bit next Friday, but all of it at the same time. Step after wearisome step, and your feet pound the pavement, your brain jostles inside your skull, sweat obscures your vision, your heart pounds in your chest, and your breathing becomes labored. I mean, who likes this? 5K is, in fact, the most I've ever run at any one time. And, and, and I thought the one mile was bad in junior high PE. I want you to imagine for a moment a 5K race with the finish line in sight. And over the PA, an announcement is made, you're almost half done with the 10K. What? This is what I felt like the last time I ran the 5K at Tempe Town Lake. You, we came around the corner, ran around the lake, came across the bridge, came down the, 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 the little pathway, and you could see the finish line. It's this big arch you're going to run through. And lo and behold, we ran right by it, and then it weaved back and forth along the sidewalk for a little while longer until you came around. And I had sprinted, exerting, given everything that I have to make to what I thought was the finish line, and it wasn't yet the finish line. And I may as well have been running a 10K for those last 100 yards. Imagine if you were to finish that 10K and they said, welcome to the half marathon. And those of you who have run half marathons, you, you're looking at those other people, those crazy people who are going to do the other 13.1. By the way, 13.1 and 26.2, you see the bumper stickers everywhere? 0.0, .0 I like that one. 
when I was new to Arizona, I, I actually asked Scott Maxwell, what, what Bible verse is that 13.1? I've looked up every chap- <laughs> book with 13 chapters and the first verse doesn't seem to make sense. He said, that's the distance of a half marathon. Oh. And then you get these people that run the 100 milers and, and beyond and they have all kinds of crazy numbers in the back of their car. Could you imagine at the end of the marathon and all those crazy people doing the 26.2 and over the PA it says, welcome to the 100 miler. And at the end of the 100 miler, you know, this race continues through Death Valley. This is an ultimate Ironman decathlon. And every time you think you're getting to the end, you just realize you've compiled more race ahead. This is the race the Jews were running. Trying and trying, running and running, never reaching the finish, never gaining the prize, always in pursuit but never attaining. This is the picture that Paul paints of the Jews trying to attain a right standing before God by law. Meanwhile, Gentiles, who didn't even know there was a race, are standing at the finish line with medals and trophies. What happened? What happened? For the Jews, the finish line got farther and farther away with every bit of ground covered. Every pounding step, every labored breath, every elevated heartbeat only added to the distance that they needed to cover. They were losing the race from the start. Now, when Paul speaks of Jews and Gentiles here, he is speaking generally. General large categories of the peoples he was dealing with in his day. It certainly was possible for Gentiles to have assumed a law righteousness approach to meriting standing with God. In fact, that's the fundamental human bent. We'll talk about that in a moment. And it certainly was possible for Jews to embrace Messiah in Jesus' day. Many did. Paul himself did. And it certainly was a reality that Old Testament Believers embraced God's saving grace by faith with a hope forward to God's provision of forgiveness of sin that would culminate in Messiah Jesus. But for the most part in Paul's days, the the Jews as a nation had rejected Messiah. They had rejected their only hope of salvation and they were clinging to a vain hope of meriting salvation Paul is answering this problem evident in the church at Rome. Why so many Gentiles and why so many Jews, especially given the Jewish advantage? Romans 3, 2, their advantage was great in every respect. First of all, they were entrusted with the very oracles of God. They had God's word, God's self-disclosure, which was a disclosure of love and grace and kindness and judgment and regulation. It was all in there. Romans 9 details more of those privileges. They are Israelites to whom belong the adoption as sons, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the temple services and promises. Whose are the fathers and from whom is the Christ, the Messiah, according to the flesh, who is overall God blessed forever. And so Paul hints at this different kind of running at the end of verse 30. The Gentiles who weren't running this race, they attained righteousness. Which righteousness did they get? This right standing before God, which is by faith. Those who weren't even racing after a right standing, and they won it. Jews, on the other hand, raced and raced after a righteousness differently than the Gentiles. Notice verse 31, Israel pursuing a law of righteousness did not arrive at that law. By law of righteousness here, Paul indicates a pursuit of law for righteousness. And Paul's going to talk about this more in the next chapter. Look down at chapter 10, verse 4. Christ is the end of, Christ is going to be the end of something. He's the end of what? The end of law for righteousness. Christ doesn't end all law giving. By the way, did you know there's over 1,100 commands in the New Testament for New Testament believers as opposed to 660 some under Mosaic law for Old Testament believers. Christ doesn't end law giving. What Christ does is end law for righteousness. This idea that you could merit right standing before God by keeping rules, by being good, by doing things. 
So Israel, generally speaking, pursued law as a means of procuring or producing or proving their inherent righteousness. They weren't looking to an alien righteousness, like Paul described in Philippians 3, a righteousness outside of themselves, given as a free gift by faith. They were looking to produce or rather prove their own inherent righteousness so that they could stand before God vindicated at the judgment so that God would say before all of heaven and before all of his creatures, that one is righteous because he did it. And of course, God will have none of that. And the Jew thinks, I I have these rules and look what I did with them. And Paul, when he met Christ, when he went to his face, realized it was all trash. See, the Jews had a low view of the standard. They had a high view of themselves. They had a low view of God and a high view of their own ability, a wrong view of sin and a wrong view of God's law. And notice how careful Paul is when he articulates the Jewish dilemma. Paul does not say, the law is bad. He can't. The law is good, and he says that elsewhere. The law was given by God. There's a biblical principle here. Paul has in view God's law, and and probably most particularly the Mosaic law given to Israel as a revelation of God's own person and a regulation of his people. The bigger principle here through the book of Romans is that law-keeping can never merit or prove human righteousness. And it doesn't matter what set of rules you use. What set of rules you put before yourself? No matter what set of regulations you set up for your own life, how you think you should live, you will break them. You can't keep your own rules. You will excuse yourself when you do break them, and you will condemn others when they break them. You will smugly assume that your estimation of your law-keeping will suffice, and that any infraction should be excused, because you're basically a good guy, and you're entitled to the rewards. And the biblical principle is that law-keeping of any sort will never bring about justification or a declaration of righteousness. Why? (laughs) Because everybody who tries to keep rules is a rule-breaker. For the Jews, they actually had God's law, not some made-up human standard. They had God's self-revelation, his right regulation of his people, and certainly they added to it, misunderstood it, But Paul does not fault the law for their shortcomings. In fact, that would be to fault God himself. The fault lies squarely at the feet of those who ran with law to try to earn God's favor. It was a misunderstanding of law, a misuse of law. It was law for righteousness. Charles Hodge says, they would not submit to be saved on the terms which God prepared, but insisted on reaching heaven in their own way. The surprising turn, the surprising truth about getting to heaven is that people who ran and ran and ran one way never found it, and people not running the race got it for free. This leads us to a second surprising truth about getting to heaven, and it is a counterintuitive reason. The counterintuitive reason why some get for free what others work so hard to try to attain is that eternal life is gained through faith. This is not the natural inclination of man. This is not intuitive. This is counterintuitive. This is surprising. The way the world works is you work hard to get something and you cash in your paycheck and you purchase something with what you have and there's a fair exchange. Paul made clear earlier in the book of Romans that Whatever you and I do, whatever it is we are punching in the time clock of our regular employment, only accrues for us judgment. And if we are to go about getting a fair exchange, we will only get wrath for our deeds. And so the sinner dare not wish for fairness or for justice in any personal sense. The counterintuitive reason that Jews racing with law to try to win right standing with God would never reach it is that eternal life is gained through faith. Look at verse 32. Why? This question is so abrupt. (laughs) Why is this true? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works, they stumbled over the stumbling stone. 
And literally, the, the sentence is much shorter than the original. Paul simply says, why? Because not by faith, but as though by works. And we have to supply the verbal ideas from the previous verse. You see, God's law here is not deficient, but God's law is the wrong vehicle for going to heaven. And the Jews that Paul is describing here are legalists. They are legalists. That is, they're committed to their rule keeping as the standard of their merit before God and the standard of their judgment of others' merit. That is what legalism is. By the way, legalism is not obedience. I know some people just say that, well, if, if you're really committed to obeying the Lord, you're a legalist. No, that's just called love. Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. That we dare not label legalism that which actually pleases our Savior, that which actually honors God, where we actually are bearing fruit in keeping with repentance, where we're actually walking in the good works, Ephesians 2.10, that God prepared in advance that we should walk in them. That's not legalism. And calling other Christians to obey is not legalism either. Legalism is all about keeping rules in order to merit your standing before God or allowing your own rule keeping to be the standard for your judgment of others' performance. And legalism is a sin that stinks to high heaven. It reeks of the sinful pride of self-sufficiency. These are true legalists that Paul is describing. They've assumed that their supposed obedience to God's law merits their place in heaven, and they are exposed for it. By the way, obedience to God's regulations for the believer whose merit comes not from himself but from the Lord Jesus Christ who has rested in Christ's work by faith who simply says, I want to please my Savior. Obedience for that one is simply an expression of faith. I believe that God's ways are good. I trust his direction. I've committed my life to his care and to his loving leadership. I want to do what he says. That's just faith. The sinful pride of self-sufficiency, true legalism, is the reason the Jews rejected the gospel. And it is the foundation of every religion on the earth. All the religions of the world can be boiled down to simply this, human achievement. The pride that says, I have what it takes to cross the goal, to, to get whatever the reward of that religion is. God's law here is not the problem. God gave his law. God expected obedience from his people. Human sin is the problem. It was, in fact, possible to live by faith under Old Testament law. Abraham lived by faith, and it was credited to him as righteousness. David was a man who lived under Mosaic law, who offered sacrifices, but knew when it came to his own sin, he only had one hope, that God would cleanse him at the heart level by some innocent sacrifice in his place. Read Isaiah 51. And when sinners do not recognize their own inability to keep God's law, and they assume that by simply possessing God's law or by conjuring up some shallow, sham, showy, merely outward conformity to some of it, that they thereby have earned a spot in heaven, when sinners do that, they only add to the list of sins for which they're already guilty. Sins which pile lifetimes of guilt upon them and sins which millions of lifetimes of law-keeping could never erase. And the pile of their debts before God only grows. The race they're running gets longer and longer. It never ends. They will never finish. Not only do they compound their guilt by assuming that law-keeping is the solution, they also reject the rescue. You see, to trust self is necessarily to reject Christ. It's like drowning the lifeguard attacking the EMT, killing the physician. Notice the last line of verse 32. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. This is the explanation of why so many Jews in Paul's day are not going to heaven. To stumble here is to strike against, to make contact with something in a violent manner. 
It can be used metaphorically to be offended at something. You can stumble over a rock or I can stumble over your words. And what is it they stumbled over? This stumbling stone in verse 32 is the gospel. It's the good news of eternal life to the undeserving. It is free, unmerited grace. It is your sins are forgiven, said to the lame man, the immoral woman, the tax collector, and the Gentile. It is today you will be with me in paradise, spoken to a thief on a cross. And the stone of stumbling here is Christ himself. Christ, you know, is the Greek word for the Hebrew term Messiah. Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah. He is the descendant of King David. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the seed of Abraham that would bring blessing to all the nations. He's the offspring of the woman who would crush the head of the snake. He's the promised one, the expected one. And we'll find out in the next verse that he himself is this stumbling stone over which the Jews tripped. And they didn't just trip over the stumbling stone, they crucified him. And in the plan of God, Israel's greatest sin, crucifying her own Messiah, actually is the means by which sins are paid for, the means by which righteousness is freely given and eternal life is guaranteed for all who will believe, Jew or Gentile. And this leads to the third surprising truth about getting to heaven. And it is a shocking purpose. You see, it is God's intention both to save and to condemn through one scandalous enterprise. Verse 33. Just as it is written, Paul here appeals to Isaiah 8 and Isaiah 28 to give us a quote. And this introductory formula, just as it is written, is a perfect tense verb. It could be translated just as it stands written. In other words, the scripture was written a long time ago and it still stands and it still speaks and it's still true and it's saying this to the Jews and the Gentiles in Paul's day and it's still saying this to us today. Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. And Paul here quotes Isaiah 28, 16 and Isaiah 8, 14. In fact, he embeds 8, 14 in the middle of 28, 16 to combine the truths of both of those passages to point forward to Christ and specifically to emphasize the twin nature of Christ's coming as a bringing forth of salvation and judgment. By the way, those are the twin themes of the book of Isaiah. Salvation is in the Lord and judgment is coming. Both are true. And the salvation is from God and the judgment is from God. And when Christ came, the one who said, I came to lay down my life for many, also said, I have come to cast fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. This stone of stumbling is Christ. Let's look at Isaiah 28. And in Isaiah 28 and Isaiah 8, both these contexts view the impending judgment that God is bringing on the nation of Israel through the nation of Assyria. God's going to use a wicked nation, Assyria, to judge Israel for all of her idolatries, her rebellion against God over the years, her failure to keep covenant and to obey God in faith. And God is bringing this other nation to judge them. And he says in verse 16, therefore, thus says the Lord Yahweh, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation firmly placed, and he who believes in it will not be disturbed. God himself promises to place a stone, send a stone, and the, the picture is of the architectural corner, the, the corner foundation of the foundation of a building cut with stone, and this chief cornerstone was to be perfectly formed, perfectly shaped, flawless, and perfectly set so that the rest of the building could be built properly upon it. 
All the other foundation stones would be set against this one, and all the layers of a building would be set on the foundation. This stone was critical. It had to be flawless. It would be the basis of God's work that he's describing. God goes on to talk about the fact that this stone is the safety of Israel, and the one who believes in him will not be disappointed. Turn back to Isaiah chapter 8. And we get the other little phrase that Paul uses and embeds within this Isaiah 28 quote. And the quote comes from verse 14. We'll begin reading in verse 13. It is Yahweh of hosts whom you should regard as holy. And he shall be your fear and he shall be your dread. One of the themes in Isaiah is if you fear God, you have nothing else to fear. He's the biggest and the strongest and the scariest. And if he's on your team, you have nothing to be afraid of. You should fear Yahweh. What did the Israelites fear? They feared Assyria and they looked to Egypt for help. <laughs> they were doing this whole thing wrong. Verse 14, then he, that is he, Yahweh, shall become a sanctuary to both houses of Israel, a stone to strike and a rock to stumble over and a snare and a trap for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Many will stumble over them. They will fall and be broken. They will be snared and caught. Well, that's a different flavor than the Isaiah 28 quote. And Paul puts the Isaiah 28 quote, which is about if you trust in this stone that God is sending, you'll be safe. And the Isaiah quote Gets, Isaiah 8 quote gets embedded right in the middle to say, uh, Yahweh is the stone that's coming and you're in trouble. You'll stumble over him. Well, we have some things to work out. Will God send the stone or will he be the stone? And the answer is yes. And will God come to judge or will he come to save? And again, the answer is yes. And notice the precision of scripture in these prophecies about Messiah, how precise they are, that the one who is sent is distinct from God and yet identified as God simultaneously. This is not the only time the Old Testament describes a person named Yahweh doing some activity that the New Testament ascribes to Jesus Christ. Perhaps you've heard the, the cults say, well, the Bible never says that Jesus is God. Well, the Bible says that Jesus is God all over the place. And one of those indications is where the Old Testament ascribes something to Yahweh, and then the New Testament says, and this is exactly what Jesus is doing, i.e., Jesus is Yahweh. He is God the Son in the flesh, come to save and come to judge. He is the stone that God placed, and he is God the stone present this is Messiah Jesus. In fact, Isaiah chapter 6 tells us that Isaiah looked up and saw Yahweh. And John 12, 41, referring to that passage, says Isaiah saw Jesus. Zechariah 12, 10 says they will, the Jews will look on Yahweh whom they pierced and they'll mourn for him as for an only son. And twice in the New Testament, what Zechariah refers to Yahweh, the New Testament ascribes to Christ. This is normal in our Bibles. In fact, Jewish interpreters took these prophecies of Isaiah 28 and Isaiah 8, and, and they had some interesting thoughts about them before Christ came. The Qumran community, those were those outsiders who lived out in the desert away from Israel because they were kind of on the run. They assumed that this referred to a righteous remnant, and they thought it was them. And the Targum of Jonathan, that is a, a Jewish commentary on the Old Testament, believed that this was a reference to Messiah, the prince of the house of David. Psalm 118 gives us another look at this stone metaphor in the Old Testament. The stone which the builders rejected becomes the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. In Daniel 2.34, we find out that the Messiah will be a stone that crushes all the kingdoms of the earth when he returns. In Luke chapter 20, I know we're weaving a lot of things together here. In Luke chapter 20, verses 17 and 18, Jesus took the Isaiah passage, the Daniel passage, and the Psalm 118 passage and wove them together to talk about himself. He said, what then is this that is written? The stone which the builders rejected became the chief cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. On whomever it falls, it will scatter them like dust. Dust. 
And so Jesus combines all of these ideas about the stone that is coming to refer to himself. And speaking in his own day about the religious leaders, he's calling them the builders that rejected their only hope. In fact, uh, he calls out the religious leaders before they crucified him that they would put him to death, the one that brings life. Here in Romans, Paul brings to mind the stone of stumbling to explain why Jews en masse have rejected the gospel. The message of Isaiah is trust in God. He's the shelter from the coming judgment, and he is the coming judgment if you reject his help. This is the message of Isaiah, judgment and salvation. It's also the message of Romans and the message of your Bible. And notice the end of this verse, verse 32 of Romans 9. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. Um, verse 33, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. This stumbling stone, this rock is an offense. It is the Greek word scandalon. It's, we get our English word scandal or scandalized from it. This scandalous affair that God is about, this enterprise that he is taking on is an offense to the Jews who are committed to meriting their own salvation. In Matthew 15, 12, the disciples came to Jesus and said to him, did you know that the Pharisees were offended, scandalized, same word, when they heard your statement? That was right after Jesus said, you know what makes a person dirty is what comes out of his heart. <laughs> and they were offended at that. The people who had the Old Testament scriptures were offended about a little lesson about human depravity. Why? Because they viewed themselves too highly. Perhaps they thought they had escaped the stain and the pollution that the rest of humanity had simply because they owned the Bible. Turn to John chapter 6. I want you to see just a couple of places and you can read through the gospels and see how many times Jesus was this offense, this scandal. We'll point to just a couple of them. John 6, 61. This is after Jesus fed the 5,000 plus uh, when he created fish out of nothing and bread out of nothing and, and fed them all. Jesus, conscious that his disciples grumbled at what he was saying, said to them, does this cause you, disciples, to stumble, to be scandalized, <laughs> to, to trip up? And what is it Jesus was saying? I didn't come to give a bunch of free lunches. <laughs> the, the, the lunch that you just had was a demonstration that I am the creator of the universe and you must have me. That's the message of John 6. And if you don't have me, you don't have anything. And, and the disciples said, this is hard to hear. The disciples were offended. Pharisees were offended. Look at John 6, 68. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. Jesus had just asked him, are you guys gonna go away too? Were you so scandalized by this that you're gonna walk? And in the faith that God himself provided to these fledgling disciples, they knew that Jesus had their only hope. John 7, 1, after these things, Jesus was walking in Galilee for he was unwilling to walk in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. How badly were the Jewish leaders scandalized by Jesus? Murderously. See, unredeemed human nature will always be scandalized by grace. Grace offends the senses. My grandpa, whom I loved, said this one day, I've worked hard all my life and you're telling me a thief on a cross can go to heaven? I will never believe that gospel. And what is scandalous to self-sufficient humans is actually the only way that sinners can be saved. People who are convinced of their own merit, their own lineage, their own Christianity, their own morality, their own goodness, their good works, they will always stumble over the gospel. We've already learned in Romans 9 that nobody gets to heaven by who they are culturally or who they are by lineage or, or what privileges they've received. In fact, all these things become a liability if you reject Christ. Christ. 
A sinful man must actually be saved from his pride of self-sufficiency. Man must be saved from religion, from merit, from feeling adequate in himself to bridge the infinite chasm between himself and God. You see, man believes that he can pay the infinite debt that he owes with the resources that he has at his own disposal to quench the infinite wrath of God with the very tools he used to provoke it. What a hopeless situation. And so Jesus says, blessed is the one who is not offended at me, Matthew eleven six, 6. And that is how Paul closes Romans 9, 33. Whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. Disappointment here is not a, a temporary bummer. This is eschatological shame. That is the day you stand before your maker exposed for who you are with only the things you've ever done. Your deeds before him seen as filthy rags. That's the shame, the disappointment that Paul is talking about here. And whoever believes in Christ, which is a contrast to trying to merit salvation, whoever believes that Christ completely paid for sin and purchased for you a righteousness that is not yours, but is given free as a gift. The one who believes that will stand before God blameless with great joy. Rather than be exposed as a sinner who never wanted to admit that he was a sinner, who hid his sin, excused his sin, blamed other for his sin, tried to make up for his sin, rejected the remedy for sin, who drowned the lifeguard, attacked the EMT and killed the physician, and now stands exposed before God with nothing to show for all of his running, all of his racing, but only to face eternal judgment in hell. I want to give us just a couple of thoughts as we close this morning. Christian, don't remove the scandal. Don't take away the scandal, the stumbling block that is the gospel of grace. Don't remove the stumbling block that is Christ. Listen, there are many stumbling blocks for the unbeliever. There are things that unbeliever might trip over. And, and, and listen, it's, it's perhaps a good-hearted desire. Let me just get those barriers out of the way so that you can have what I love, so that you can have Christ and you can have eternal life. I, I understand the impulse of wanting to remove those barriers. But these are stumbling blocks that God has placed. Did you hear Isaiah? Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone. God put it there. And there are any stumbling blocks for the unbeliever, and they must trip over them. We, we don't grease the slide to destruction by taking away the things that God has revealed, which unbelievers have a hard time hearing. Election, creation, depravity, the hopelessness of the human condition, the grace of the gospel. These are God's stones. Christ, Jesus, the, the Jesus revealed in Scripture is God's stumbling block. He placed him there, and he is the only hope for sinners. A second thought, what's at stake here is a glory fight. A glory fight between God and man. This section of Scripture culminates in Romans 11. From him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. This is the way God has designed it. He's designed salvation plan and salvation history so that no one may boast and so that God gets the glory. Any attempt to merit favor with God or merit standing with God or earn righteousness is a theft of glory from the one who will have all glory. You won't win that fight. A third thought, and, and I would speak this last one to you. Maybe you're here this morning and, and you haven't had your sins forgiven. Let me just encourage you, don't drown the lifeguard. Don't kill the physician. Don't run a race you can't finish, a race that gets worse with every step that you take. The futility of, of trying to be entitled to heaven by what you do or who you are. Listen, if, if the Jews couldn't get in, that is, if, if a lifetime, if generations of, if centuries of Jewish attempts at keeping the law, and not just any law, but the, the best attempts at keeping the best law, only ends up in filthy rags and refuse. Isaiah 64, 6 and Philippians 3. 
then whatever our puny, short-lived, half-hearted attempts at being good people, whatever they amount to, are, are far worse. And yet the pride and self-satisfaction that comes with assuming that we're good people, that, that assumes an entitlement before an infinite God, the God who made you, the God who sustains you every moment, the God who will hold you accountable for every thought, every motive, every deed. As long as you refuse his son, you reject your only hope of eternal life. Let me just ask you, repent of all of it. Turn away from yourself and look to Christ. He is the one that said, take my yoke upon you. It's light. If you've had a high view of yourself, it's not worth holding on to. If you've assumed your basic innate goodness, that will kill you. Listen to the physician, the healer of souls. Trust the rescuer and don't drown flailing in your own attempts to merit God's favor. If you'd like to speak with somebody about how to have eternal life, a whole host of people would love to introduce you to the free grace of God in Jesus Christ. Maybe someone that brought you. You can come talk to me. You can speak with any of the people you saw at the stage up here up front today. If you'd like to pray with somebody, don't hesitate at the information table or, or, or up here up front to ask somebody to talk to you about how to know Christ. Well, let's pray now. God, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the clarity and the simplicity of your plan of salvation for sinners. God, we pray that you would break down the barriers in the human heart, the barriers of pride and self-sufficiency, self-merit. Would you break those down and, and bring in a flood of grace and kindness and love such that could never be known apart from the gospel. And even this day, O oh Lord, would you bring eternal life to someone who recognizes perhaps for the first time that they're in need. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.